Good evening and welcome to this first Humanities Forum of the fall 2012 semester, the first in this building, and the culminating event in today's series of events opening this new building. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for your Sitzfleisch, as they would say in German, your ability to keep sitting. Um, and let me tell you a little bit. I'm Rebecca Bowling. I'm the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. And I want to tell you a little bit about our lineup for the next several humanities forums, first of all. Um, of course, you're here to hear um, Pauline Yu, um, the president of the American Council of Learned Societies tonight, and she will be introduced by our president, Freeman Habrowski, in just a few minutes. Um, on the 27th, um, we will be having the annual Robert K. Webb History Department Lecture, and Judy Walkowitz is coming to speak from Johns Hopkins um, at 5 p.m., and the title of her talk is Schleppers and Shoppers, Jews, Street Markets, and the Selling of Ready-to-Wear Fashion in London in the 1920s and 30s. Then on October the 10th, it was in the midst of Ancient Studies Week. We will be having Marden Nichols from the Walters Art Museum, who will be speaking on not always Roman, not always statues. The recent lives of ancient Roman statues at the Walters Art Museum. Then on the 15th of October, Michael Berube, the president of the Modern Language Association and the director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities at Penn State, will be speaking about disability, justice, and the future of the humanities. And then ending up October, and I won't go into November yet, but ending up October, on the 29th of October, we will be having Juno Diaz, who will be reading from his latest collection of short stories, This Is How You Lose Her, and that will be at 7 o'clock. So I encourage you, we've just put out some of these brochures. If you don't already have one outside the door, please pick one up. It's also um, online under our umbc.edu backslash Drescher Center website for more information on that. Now, I'd like to um, ask my colleague um, and friend, Jessica Berman, um, outgoing chair of the English department, to just come up for just a second. And on behalf of the chairs and directors she would, of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, she would like to make a presentation. Um, I'm not going to talk for long. This has been a long day. And um, I don't know how Freeman does this to talk all day <laughs> so many times. And of course, we're all excited to hear tonight's speaker. Um, but as many of you know, John Jeffries, the dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and also a long-term member of the UMBC History Department is retiring this year. So in order to celebrate Dean Jeffries and his wife Renata Jeffries, also a long-term supporter of UMBC, and especially its arts and humanities programs, the chairs of the departments and programs in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences have gotten together to dedicate two seats in the theater we're all sitting in tonight in their honor. Um, they are seats C110 and 111, I think right in front of you. And unfortunately, the plaques are not on them yet. There was a snafu. We were, had hoped to just unveil them tonight. Um, this dedication recognizes John Jeffrey's important work as dean to advance the college as a whole, as well as his dedication to the creation of this building, which we've really been talking about all day. Um, you know, with, I can just say, without his efforts, we would not be sitting here. Um, but it's, it also reflects his clear and consistent vision kept in sight with, throughout his long career of the abiding importance to UMBC of research and teaching in the liberal arts, a vision also shared by Renata. This vision has helped to shape the university we inhabit today and will leave a strong legacy for its future. So let me just tell you, the plaques on the seats, when they get here, will read, Honoring John W. Jeffries, Liberal Arts Champion, from the CAS Chairs and Directors 12, and Honoring Renata S. Jeffries, Stalwart UMBC Supporter, from the CAS Chairs and Directors of 12. Please join me in applauding John and Renata Jeffries. Yes, you 
Welcome back. Yes. <laughs> And now I think I'm going to follow John Jeffrey's lead from earlier today when it comes to introducing Freeman Habrowski, who will be introducing our speaker tonight. I don't think he really needs an introduction. He's an amazing man, an amazing president, an amazing colleague, I think I can call him that. And we also owe him a great deal to have this building today. So thank you very much. What I didn't say today is that my mother, the English teacher, would be very pleased if she were walking around today. Uh, and, and that means more to me than you can imagine. John, you have been magnificent. You have been just that. And we look forward to continuing to have you as a part of this community. Uh, I want to thank Rebecca, of course, and all of you, all of our chairs who are here, faculty, our students, humanity scholars, it's a very special day for all of us. I think we're all running on empty almost, and yet we are more elevated than ever. We really are. And I think it is so fitting that this evening we have a special, special guest. The American Council of Learned Societies describes the humanities as those fields of knowledge concerned with human thought, experience, and creativity, and humanists as those who help us appreciate and understand what distinguishes us as human beings, as well as what unites us. How fitting it is then that our first guest is Pauline Yu, the president of the ACLS. Dr. Yu received her bachelor's in history and literature from Harvard University and her master's and PhD in comparative literature from Stanford. She's authored or edited five books, including the reading of imagery in the Chinese poetic tradition. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and before she worked there, from ACLS. Um, indicative of the way she has pursued her own scholarship while advancing that of others in the humanities, she was awarded the William Riley Parker Prize for best article of 2007 from the Journal of the Modern Language Association of America. She's been a faculty member at UCAL Irvine, at Columbia, and at the University of Minnesota. She was Dean of Humanities in the College of Letters and Science at UCLA and also Professor of East Asian Languages and culture, be Cultures before becoming President of the ACLS almost 10 years ago. Uh, the ACLS was founded in 1919 and, and is a private, nonprofit federation of 71 national scholarly organizations representing American scholarship in the humanities and related social sciences. Central to its work is the advancement of scholarship by awarding fellowships and strengthening relations among learned societies. It also supports scholarly conferences, reference works, and innovations in scholarly communications. It is such an honor to have her here. We had a chance to talk in the reception, and what I really liked was her talking about how we might partner and be more a part of what's going on with the organization. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Pauline Yu. Thank you. Thank you, President Hrabowski, for that very gracious introduction, and thank you also for being such a stalwart supporter of the humanities and arts. Uh, when I mentioned to uh, one of my board members, um, whom I think you know, Charlotte Koo, um, last night, that I was coming uh, here to UMBC today, she said, oh, I hope you'll get to meet uh, the president. I wish we could clone him. 
And I think, I think that's what a lot of people would like to be able to do. Um, it's been a real um, thrill to be here as part of your celebration. It's actually my first time in Baltimore. I've been through on the train, of course, several times, but never have had the chance to get off. Um, Although, as a, um, certainly, it's, the city's always been a part of my consciousness because I grew up in Rochester, New York, where the Rochester Red Wings are the AAA team for the Baltimore Orioles. And <laughs> so I've, I have felt this connection for a long time, I think, with Baltimore, and it's, glad, and it's nice to be able to actually um, make it come real. Um, Rebecca Bowling has been a terrific host today. Um, uh, taking time out from her very busy uh, schedule, your very busy schedule, to pick me up at the hotel and bring me here. And I've had a wonderful time talking with um, some of your humanities scholars, students. Um, this is a program that I really can't think of any equivalent for in any other university in the country, a, a program that targets the really outstanding undergraduates and ent entering freshmen um, with scholarship support and, and um, encourages them to, to study the humanities. I think it's a terrific model and I, the only reason I wouldn't want more people to know about it, it was, is it would become even harder than it already is to, to, to get one of these um, scholarships. So I think you should be very, very proud of that. And of course, very proud of what this day has meant for the university. I think um, everybody deserves to be congratulated from the faculty, the dean, uh, the president, the provost, uh, to the governor and the legislature for recognizing the importance of, of the um, humanities and arts on this campus. Um, the center manifests in beautifully concrete form the university's principled commitment to maintaining the humanities and arts at the center of a liberal arts education. Um, I'm honored to have been invited to participate in this event, to be here as part of the humanities forum of the Drescher Center. There have been many intellectual and, and uh, institutional innovations in the academic humanities in the past half century, and the flourishing of campus humanities centers is certainly one of the most prominent among them, and I'm sure that the Drescher Center's teaching, research, and public programming will thrive in this new space. Now, among other things, the humanities teach us to pay heed to history. And this year, we have many reminders of how the past shapes the present. We marked the 225th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution just two days ago. Maryland's car license plates remind us that we celebrate the bicentennial of the War of 1812, which gave us our national anthem and gave to our neighbor Canada, the determination to remain only a neighbor. In 2012, we are also in the midst of commemorating the sesquicentennial of the momentous Civil War. Indeed, this year's most notable anniversary is probably that of the issuance of the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation 150 years ago this week, which marked the beginning of the death of slavery in the United States. Even as slavery began to die, the national constellation of land-grant universities, which represents, I think, America's signal contribution to the history of higher education in the world, was born. For it was in that same year, on July 2nd, 1862, that President Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, which provided public lands to the several states on the condition that proceeds of the sale of those lands be devoted to establishing public colleges and universities, for wit, for, quoting from the act, the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits of and professions in life. I'll repeat that with my own emphasis, a liberal and practical education. Now to be sure the act specified that the new institutions would give scope to the agricultural and mechanical arts, but it required explicitly that this emphasis not exclude the classics and other fields. We thus have from the 37th Congress meeting 150 years ago, the affirmation that higher education is a public good. Um, that higher education is not mere workforce preparation, although it will certainly prepare you well for work, but education for life. And that such an education should include what we now call the humanities. Now, sadly, many of today's policymakers in the 112th Congress and elsewhere, seem determined to celebrate that an anniversary instead by further reducing public support for colleges and universities and promoting the growth of for-profit institutions. 
I think it's therefore incumbent on all of us who prize and, and pursue humanities scholarship to make the case for its enduring value. Now, bicentennials, sesquicentennials, and centennials may especially be on my mind these days because my organization itself, as you may have just heard, will soon be celebrating its 100th birthday. Now, I'm not sure if one were founding an institution in 2012 that you, one would choose a name as rarefied as the American Council of Learned Societies. In fact, I'm quite sure you probably wouldn't. My staff would certainly be the first in line for the name change. But that name made sense when we were founded more than 93 years ago uh, in 1919, and it made sense for very political reasons. After World War I, the British Academy sought to build a new international union of national academies in the wake of the failure of the politicians to establish the League of Nations. But they wondered who should re represent the United States in this new union. So Lord James Bryce, who's a distinguished scholar and the former ambassador uh, of Great Britain to the United States, posed that question to his friend J. Franklin Jameson of the American Historical Association and said, so what would be the most appropriate re representative from the, from the United States? Should it be the American Academy of Arts and Sciences or the American Philosophical Society? And I think you're a member of, of both of these very august bodies. They were both founded in the 18th century. They boasted distinguished memberships, albeit selective and exclusive. No, replied Jameson, precisely because those institutions were aristocratic in their organizational character, they were not in keeping with the democratic ethos of our country. Better, he advised to form a new federation of professional scholarly societies, organizations dedicated to the advancement of learning, but open and inclusive in their membership. And thus was born the ACLS as a representative of American higher education of American in the humanities to this international union of academies, which still meets every year to this day. We began with 13 societies as our founding societies. We now have, as you heard, 71. Now, I think Jameson's response highlights key characteristics of the modern American learned society. It is voluntary in its membership and leadership. It's open and inclusive. It's dedicated, above all, to knowledge, qua knowledge, in research, teaching, and practice. And I think this formula has proved remarkably durable and capable of growth. UMBC, I would note, also combines these values, a commitment to scholarly excellence and a belief in both accessibility and inclusivity in the pursuit of that excellence. Well, if 1919 saw the birth of ACLS, an organization dedicated to the advancement of the humanities, it must also be said that <clears throat> at that time, a specter already haunted the humanities at the same time, the specter of marginalization. As science and research modeled after science began to reshape the American university then, so did it also influence the contours of scholarship outside of science. In surveying the history of humanistic inquiry and practice, the historian Lawrence Fazy remarked on their struggle for a precise definition, in contrast to the perceived clarity of mission in the sciences. Theirs is the story, he wrote, not so much of the creation of professions from scratch, as of the transition from an older, long-existing professional outlook and mentality to newer, more specialized versions of it. Within the still relatively new philanthropical foundations, officers also struggled to find a compelling justification for investment in the humanities that would suggest how to direct their largesse. In 1924, Edwin R. Embry, who was a Rockefeller Foundation officer, discuss the humanities as of the greatest importance to any well-balanced society, but nonetheless saw the field as one generally addressed only after more basic needs were satisfied, a, like a leisure time activity. He noted that the humanities and the fine arts are in danger of neglect today in the world generally and in America in particular, and that there was little concerted effort or wise giving in those fields. Plus ça change, right? <laughs> Now, with the quick march of science, wrote another foundation officer, Abraham Flexner, philosophy and humanism have gone under a cloud. When they assert themselves, they are prone to do so apologetically on the ground that they too are or can be scientific. 
This meme of marginalization and requisite apology remains extraordinarily powerful today. When Inside Higher Ed, it's a respected web-based journal, carried a report on the formation of the Congressional Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences, of which I'm honored to be a member, it described the commission as an effort to put those fields on an equal footing on the public agenda with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM fields. The story was headlined, yanked from the margins, as if such location were sufficient to denote our beleaguered disciplines. Other metaphors express much the same idea. A recent article on Stanford University in the New Yorker quoted its former president, Gerhard Casper, as worrying that the phenomenal sums to be gained by university participation in the marketplace for technological innovation might mean even less funding of and attention to the arts and humanities, which are already, in his words, marked by the cliché that they are but the stepchildren of the university and sometimes even well-meaning supporters wishing to compliment the humanities or their distinct, on their distinctiveness supply inadvertent contributions to the same meme of mar marginalization. Two years ago, the New York Times columnist David Brooks, as you may recall, wrote a piece entitled History for Dollars, in which he sought to stand up for the history, English, and art classes even in the face of today's economic realities. He introduced the subject by predicting that with the ec economic slowdown, the humanities will continue their long slide out of the center of higher education. Or as he put it in the first line of the article, when the going gets tough, the tough take accounting. Once the stars of university life, he wrote, humanities now play bit roles. There is certainly value to humanistic study, he argues. Studying the humanities improves your ability to read and write. It will give you a familiarity with the language of emotion and a wealth of analogies. But for him, these benefits are mere door prizes, for in his view, the important subject of the humanities, its distinctive offering, is the opportunity to befriend the big shaggy, his catch-all representation for the myriad aspects of human behavior that can't be explained by the natural or social sciences, love, courage, grace, delusion, dedication. Art and literature represent the upheavals of thought that emanate from the big shaggy, Studying them will open rich veins of emotional knowledge, even if, he cautions, it's probably dangerous to enter exclusively into this realm and risk being caught in a cloister, removed from the market and its accountability. Now, I appreciate anyone who recommends the study of the humanities, and Brooks is a valued colleague on the, on the Humanities Commission, but I think he fails to account for the many connections between the highly practical and the deeply interpretive values of humanistic study. The humanities are not limited to conveying the romantic varieties of, of individual experience, important as those may be. The results of humanistic research connect the everyday and the extraordinary. They can be supremely practical, and I simply note that anyone who has used a dictionary has benefited from humanistic research. The humanities are systems of knowledge that enable us to explore and understand the intricacies of the world's diverse histories and cultures. That is the context of today's daily, complex, global interactions. The domain of the humanities stretches far beyond the cloister. Advocates for the humanities should not apologize, nor should they self-marginalize. We can and must state clearly and concisely that the humanities are an essential element of our intellectual and cultural infrastructure, just as utilities, transportation companies, and banks are essential elements of our economic infrastructure. The humanities have always been integral to the university's role as a knowledge-bearing institution, as an incubator of innovation, and as an essential repository of intellectual freedom. The humanities help us understand the cultural heritage that has shaped our civilization through history, as well as what will make life meaningful and coherent tomorrow. The capacities of the humanities and the social sciences are ever more necessary in an interconnected world where individuals and cultures brush up against each other, interact, and recombine. Humanistic expertise is crucial to addressing the numerous social, cultural, and ethical questions raised in a host of other fields, public health, environmental policy, bioengineering, uh, foreign affairs, national defense, economic development, you, you name it, the list goes on. 
Without the knowledge provided by the humanities, we would not be able to understand where we have come from, where we are, or where we are going. The humanities, that is, help us recognize our system of values, the values with which we navigate the confusion we call life. And scholarship in the humanities is extraordinarily vibrant. On what basis do I make that assertion? The evidence cascades into the ACLS offices every year, or more precisely, into our computer servers. Our annual competitions for fellowships and grants receive more than 3,000 applications and 11,000 reference letters for the more than 350 awards to be made in our various competitions, awards that last year carried a total of $15 million. Our intensive peer review structure mobilizes the essentially voluntary work of nearly 700 scholars. I serve as reviewer in two of our competitions, and I can assure you that it is hard work indeed, but work that leaves absolutely no doubt about the quality of humanity scholarship today. The importance of the questions posed in proposals, the acuity of the arguments made, the impressive range of the evidence already marshaled, and the expressiveness with which conclusions are presented all provide stunning evidence of the cumulative process, progress of humanity scholarship. Regrettably, the, the chances of getting a, a fellowship are, are terribly low, but that comp very competition, I think, affirms the, the depth of the quality. At a recent meeting of the ACLS board, one member who had won a scholarship, I think, fellowship about 30 years ago, and also recently served as a reviewer, remarked both happily and ruefully that there was no way that his proposal would be competitive today. As you may know, two colleagues from UMBC, both from the Department of History, have recently received ACLS fellowships. Uh, Professor Terry Boughton won our Oscar Hanlon Fellowship, which is awarded to support research projects in American history that make particularly intensive and extensive use of archives. The prize-winning book resulting from his fellowship, Taming Democracy, shows that the complex and contested relationship of wealth, poverty, and politics has been a highly charged current in American history long before Occupy Wall Street made the headlines a year ago. That Professor Boughton also won the UMBC 2012 to 15 Presidential Teaching Award shows how alive the concept of the scholar teacher is on this campus. And Professor Ann Sarah Rubin received an ACLS Digital Innovation Fellowship. Her project, Marching Through Dixie, Sherman's March in America, poses an important historiographical question, how historical memory is constructed and perpetuated, and proposes to address it by using new digital technologies that can map, blend maps, images, sound, and text. It's scholarship like this that helps us make the case for the vitality of the humanities. If we are to give the infrastructure of intellectual innovation in the humanities both the attention and the resources it requires, we must be prepared to be forceful and articulate advocates. And I think there are several points that we must drive home. First, it cannot be asserted strongly enough that the humanities are research fields. They're not simply compendia of received wisdom or refined taste acquired through extensive connoisseurship. I think this simple proposition is obvious to many in this room, but it's easily submerged because the practice of humanities research is often individualistic, and the results of humanities research are likely to be presented in a narrative or an essay form that does not explicitly recapitulate the process of discovery and research as a standard in the natural and social sciences. But everything we value about the humanities, the knowledge they convey, the insights they provoke, the understandings they sustain, all of that derives ultimately from the hard work of skilled and dedicated researchers. Humanities research requires advanced expertise, exacting methods, and authoritative standards. Without the knowledge and skills of human humanities researchers, our rich past would be opaque to us. As the historian Anthony Grafton of Princeton has pointed out, the rigorous methods and standards of the humanities give them a critical role in preserving the cultural heritage of the nation and world, preserving languages, preserving skill in the authentication and interpretation of works of art, preserving long form, demanding expository writing. Of course, all of these areas also produce innovations, new pedagogies for classical languages such as Arabic, Greek, Chinese, and Latin, for example, as well as for the whole range of modern languages. 
But there are central humanistic skills, largely traditional in nature, such as the editing and interpretation of difficult texts in little known languages, which American universities have fostered and preserved. My second point is a corollary to the first. Humanities research constantly renews itself, asking questions again that were thought to be definitively answered, and it transforms how we see the world around us. That transformation is consequential, and I'll just give you one sesquicentennial example. In the past 50 years, an efflorescence of scholarship on race in America has revised in significant ways how we understand the Civil War. As Harvard President Drew Faust pointed out in her recent Jefferson lecture for the NEH, commemorations of the war's centennial in the early 1960s looked back to a war between the states, which was portrayed primarily as a class clash of industrial and agricultural civilizations. Today, we understand that racial slavery was the root cause of the irrepressible conflict, and that African Americans were critical agents of their own emancipation. Research tests old ideas and creates new ones. Without the renewal provided by research, the public humanities and the humanities in the curriculum would quickly wither away. And I don't need to tell you that a distinctive feature of humanities research and almost all new knowledge produced through it is that it's largely a public good, yielding little commercial gain to its creators. While the printed or digital presentation of new knowledge can be copyrighted, the knowledge itself cannot be patented or sold. Any investor in humanities research is investing on behalf of the public. A third point of advocacy, as I've already suggested, is one clearly enacted here at UMBC, and that's that humanities research catalyzes teaching. Just as students who directly engage with faculty have a better educational outcome, faculty who directly engage with what they teach provide a better education. Over the past 150 years, American higher education has grown in scope and expanded in power because individual faculty in this system assume the dual role of scholar and teacher. This paradigm, so deeply in, assumed in the United States that it's often implicit, posits that there is no disconnect between research and teaching, and that scholar teachers whose intellectual horizons are broadened by research are best able to educate students, expanding their intellectual horizons and inculcating in them the same habits of lifelong critical inquiry that they practice themselves. I think one of the best examples of this power is recounted by my friend Andy Delbanco in his recent terrific book, College, What It Was, Is, and Should Be. As he says, when the noted art historian Meyer Shapiro would lecture on Cezanne to his students at Columbia, they are supposed to have said, whatever he's smoking, I'll have some. Point four, the humanities undergird democracy. I think this point was made very effectively by a faculty committee at UCLA, this is after I left, which recommended the development of a humanities institute on that campus a few years ago. And let me just quote at some length from their report. The humanities constitutes the core of the liberal arts. The artes liberales, which might be translated as the arts of, of the free, are sometimes cast as a costly luxury for those fortunate enough to evade honest toil. This criticism assumes that the relevant freedom is economic. But the fundamental concern of the liberal arts is intellectual freedom, which we may note regularly leads to and protects political and economic freedom. A liberal arts education then takes its place alongside the military, a free press, and constitutional law in securing a free society. If it is a luxury, it is a luxury as modern medicine is a luxury, a large-scale institution that emerged only as the result of centuries of development, whose goal is the preservation and enhancement of human life and human dignity. Higher education, with its aim of improving the human mind, culture, and communication, will inevitably produce graduates who are well prepared for a changing, flexible, global marketplace. Our goal, this is at UCLA, is not only to prepare students to enter the marketplace and take their station as productive employees. Rather, our goal is also to produce educated human beings capable of understanding and shaping both the marketplace and society at large, 
intelligently, creatively, insightfully, knowledgeably, and independently as they see fit. Luke Menand, professor of English at Harvard and staff writer at The New Yorker, maintains that the academic's job in a free society is to serve the public culture by asking the questions the public does not want to ask, by investigating the subjects it cannot or will not investigate, by accommodating the voices it fails or refuses to accommodate. Academics need to look to the world to see what kind of teaching and thinking needs to be done and how they might better organize themselves to do it. But they need to ignore the world's insistence that they reproduce its self-image. I think the questions Monan refers to are precisely those posed by the humanities. Democracy is grounded in the ability to ask them and to be able to evaluate critically the answers to them to be able to tell the difference between an argument supported by evidence and an opinion. The objects of humanistic research may often be subject to dispute, ineffable or even ambiguous, but ambiguity is an essential element of the human condition, one that humanities researchers work with and not around. These questions may also, as Manan suggests, be ones that the academic community itself does not always wish to entertain, as one example from the history of the last generation may illustrate. The struggles against totalitarianism in World War II and the Cold War reminded university leaders of the value of free ethical, philosophical, and literary inquiry, of the importance of focusing on individual human experience and not subjugating it to mass generalizations. As universities enrolled more diverse student bodies, the humanities were instrumental in helping to ignite and interpret what David Hollinger of Berkeley has referred to as the dynamics of inclusion, so important to a pluralistic society. New methods and subjects emerged, gender and ethnic studies, new theoretical paradigms, a broadening of the scope of humanistic inquiry to include the many ways in which humans create and find meaning, including popular culture as well as high culture. As this new territory was explored, the intellectual dynamism of the humanities was polemically portrayed as a normative weakness or scholarly caprice during the culture wars of the 1980s and 90s. In 1997, Princeton University Press published a book with a title that is both arresting and plaintive. What's happened to the humanities, they asked. The title sought to capture the discomfort and uncertainty some observers felt with the new methods and subjects introduced into humanities studies in the previous 30 years. The distinguished contributors to this volume sought to reassure their readers that these new directions did not alter the fundamental purpose of the academic humanities, but rather extended it. Indeed, the fact that the knowledge base and the knowledge claims of the humanities change over time demonstrates that we are fulfilling our basic function. As Patricia Meyer Spax has written, the study of the humanities reveals in new terms, terms that we can recognize, the enduring vitality and meaning of past achievements. And it encourages the fresh energies of our immediate culture, new ways of thinking, new objects of thought. As our lives change, so do the questions we have of the past. Just as science advances by discovery, the humanities build new knowledge by interrogating old ideas. At ACLS, we have documented that change over the last 30 years through our Charles Homer Haskins Prize Lectures, delivered at our annual meeting each May. You can find these on our website, um, acls.org. All the texts of every lecture given um, are there, from the first one in 1983, given by Maynard Mack in the Department of English, to the most recent one delivered by Joyce Appleby in, in Philadelphia last May. Each year, delegates from our learned societies select a distinguished senior scholar to deliver this Haskins lecture, asking her or him to reflect on a lifetime of work as a scholar, on the motives, the chance determinations, the satisfactions, and the dissatisfactions of the life of learning, and to explore through one's own life the larger institutional life of scholarship. The resulting intellectual autobiographies, I think one scholar, Riley, referred to his as an auto-obituary, collectively limb the changing intellectual landscape of the humanities, both the slow evolution of new ideas and the sometimes tectonic shifts in how academic life was organized and populated. 
The generation that fled Nazism is particularly well represented by Paul Oscar Christeller, Judith Sklar, Theodore Marone, and Peter Gay. The historian Karl Shorsky was one of the several distinguished wartime researchers who found the World War II Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, to be like a second graduate school. The lectures of Linda Nochlin and Gerda Lerner describe the challenges they faced as they sought to widen the lens of history and history more generally to include women as subjects and agents, to consider changing gender roles as a subject of academic inquiry and not a naturalized and immutable part of life. John Hope Franklin recounts how the intellectual activism of building the field of African American history reinforced his social activism during the civil rights movement. I really can't do justice to the richness of the intellectual history that's presented in this set of lectures, and I do urge you to go look, read some of them. But I think just one example may serve as an illustration. Clifford Geertz, who died in 2006, was perhaps the best known and widest read living anthropologist of his generation. In his Haskins lecture of 1999, he recounts how he came to rework the very concept of culture itself. When Geertz began his fieldwork in Indonesia, anthropologists saw culture as a diffuse and all-embracing, all-seasons explanation for anything human beings might contrive to do, imagine, say, be, or believe. It was a super-organic force that shapes our lives as a cake mold shapes a cake, or gravity our movements. But as Geertz began participating in the life of a Balinese village during his dissertation field work, he found that this free-floating concept, which sounds kind of like an anthropological big shaggy, could not help him in understanding his new neighbors or in discovering who they think they are, what they think they are doing, and to what end they think they are doing it. To achieve that understanding, it was necessary, he concluded, to gain a working familiarity with the frames of meaning within which people enact their lives using conceptual tools drawn from philosophy, linguistics, semiotics, history, psychology, sociology, and the cognitive sciences, as well as to some degree in biology and literature. This focus on meaning and meaning making helped him to see his neighbors as active agents in creating their own life's experiences, not as automatons playing out a predetermined script. Geertz's powerful new conceptualization not only moved symbolic anthropology to the center of intellectual life, but it also highlights the one central object of all the humanities, understanding how humans create and express meaning. The emergence in the late 20th century of new objects of study and new angles of vision, most notably in attention to peoples and social processes heretofore ignored, prepared the humanities for their public role today. When the Harvard professor Howard Mumford Jones was chair of the ACLS board in the 50s and 60s, he could confidently re refer in, in a book he wrote about the humanities, which is still one of the best accounts of their importance, as one great society. He was speaking, after all, of an era when ideological unity and demographic homogeneity were arguably more the norm than the exception in American higher education. But today we need to understand the many great societies that make up our world, their cultures, histories, and particularities. We need to understand the particularities of diverse human experiences, as well as the inter interconnectedness of those experiences and our one small world, however fraught and tense these connections may be. These specificities of culture persist in demonstrating their enduring power, and the humanities have a special role to play in enhancing our interpretations of them. And this is my fifth point of advocacy for the humanities, their crucial role in providing the means with which to understand the world we inhabit. It is the humanists' insistence on local knowledge that can help to focus and clarify the vision of an otherwise monocular globalizing lens. Ever since the tragedies of September 11th, we've frequently heard the phrase, now more than ever, used to advocate the need for sustained study of languages and cultures other than our own. But hasn't the imperative always been there, as well as our central role in responding to it? I've often quoted the sociologist Nancy Ruther, who said, higher education is an aquifer, 
not a spigot. Colleges and universities, she argues, cannot be built in response to immediate needs as the spigot someone can turn on for the expertise they need at the moment, but should be conceived as a deep reserve built up slowly and sustained over the long term on the assumption that those specific needs will arise, they cannot be anticipated. Global education takes time and commitment. Deep knowledge of particular parts of the world cannot be produced overnight, as Mary Louise Pratt, the former president of the Modern Language Association, has written. It has to be built up over years, supported through real relationships with people and institutions abroad, passed along, invested in, and valued independent of the contingencies, fears, and passions of a moment. And that is why no understanding of the globalizing world, I think, can be achieved without a sustained commitment to humanistic study. This is a process that has taken much time. In looking at the history of the growing internationalization of US higher education, one can identify a number of stages. An early and necessary step was to include the wider world in the university's curriculum and research program in the first place. You might call this, We Study You. ACLS, I'm proud to say, played a not insignificant role in this process, both by bringing peop people together who shared a commitment to area studies and by supporting their research enterprise. It took considerable effort, beginning in the early 20th century, to build within US higher education capacities for the study of the world's histories and cultures. And it was certainly a joint project of, the, of philanthropic foundations, the federal government, and universities themselves. After World War II, this paradigm of we study you was expanded to we help you through exchange programs, educational development assistance, and support for foreign students to come to US universities. Toward the end of the 20th century, we collaborate and partner with you emerged as a new paradigm as the infrastructure of international scholarship became sufficiently robust to support borderless research networks. Today, as we observe the proliferation of efforts to create a multinational university on the part of many institutions in the United States and elsewhere, I think one can conceive of them as representing the next logical step in this history of academic internationalization at the core of which lies the insight that we are you, and that in the future the work of creating, transmitting, and conserving knowledge must not be compartmentalized in separate national silos. Within these transformations, however, I think it's also true that the rest of the world has come to recognize that the manifest strengths of the American university, central among them, its historical commitment to the humanities and the liberal arts, have made it a true global exemplar, even as current fiscal stringencies are pressing hard upon it. That the US system of higher education is actually at the apogee of its worldwide influence, while increasingly undervalued at home, is, to say the least, ironic. Even as public disinvestment in higher education continues apace here, many national educational systems elsewhere are aspiring to and converging on American models. Observers in the United States have witnessed the astonishing expansion and ambition of higher education around the world, especially in Asia, with a raft of mixed feelings. But I think we may be heartened by the positive valuations of the humanities in the patterns and predilections of the global university. Richard Levin, the president of Yale University, has documented in a recent article what he identifies as the rise of Asia's universities. The governments of China, India, Singapore, and South Korea, he reports, understand that world-class universities are the ideal place to educate students for careers in science, industry, government, and civil society creating people who have the intellectual breadth and critical thinking skills to solve problems, to innovate, and to lead. Scientists, engineers, and corporate leaders in the United States have pointed to this Asian university boom and warned of a gathering storm of economic and educational competition in which those nations will dwarf American educational capacities and by extension, economic innovation and productivity. But President Levin notes a somewhat different dynamic, which is interesting. While US and British politicians worry that Asia, and China in particular, 
is training more scientists and engineers than the West, he writes, the Chinese and others in Asia are worrying that their students lack the independence and creativity necessary for their country's long-term economic growth. They fear that specialization makes their graduates narrow and that traditional Asian pedagogy makes them unimaginative. Officials in China, Singapore, and South Korea have become increasingly attracted to the American model of undergraduate education, a model of multidisciplinary liberal education rooted in the humanities. And indeed, as, as you probably know, one example of this is Yale is responding to this motivation by cooperating with the National University of Singapore to develop a new residential liberal arts college with the humanities at the heart of the curriculum. Now, it's certainly a complicated undertaking, but I think that the truly bilateral thrust of the questions they are asking as they shape their new curriculum, which do not assume the supremacy of Western theoretical paradigms, may represent one of the most truly comparative ventures in cross-cultural study that we will be able to witness. And I think it's a path-breaking effort that is well worth watching. In China, part of the zeal of university leaders for a well-balanced university with a strong liberal arts component derives very much from experiencing what actually happens when you divert higher education from its humanistic core. Professor William Kirby of Harvard has described that history, which portrays the desperate cul-de-sac that is the destination of university systems that marginalize the humanities to the point of extinction. In an article entitled On Chinese, European, and, and American Uni Universities, Kirby takes note of the contemporary global ferment that I've just referred to in higher education. Universities are expanding, changing their curricula, extending their reach in all three regions, China, Europe, and, and and the United States. In China, that expansion is taking place on an epoch, epochal scale, a revolution in mass higher education that dwarfs that of the United States in the 1950s and that of Europe in the 1970s, he writes. By 2020, China aims to enroll as much as 40% of young adults in colleges and universities, and Chinese universities now lead the world in the annual production of PhDs. Kirby correctly states that this enormous growth is a welcome challenge to American universities, a challenge for both competition and cooperation. But as he stresses, this is a competition among institutions, not among nation states. Harvard, Oxford, Beida, Todai, Berlin, all confront the same question. How do we ensure that even though our universities will still be based in a home country with national responsibilities, we also fulfill our international responsibilities, training students who will be citizens of the world. One of the most effective answers to that question, it turns out, is to place liberal education and the humanities at the core of the university. Kirby finds great global interest, especially in China, and this echoes what, what uh, Levin was saying, in what may seem a counterintuitive move of stressing these values in an age increasingly dominated by science and technology. The ideal of a broad general education is, of course, nothing new to Chinese civilization, even if the label comes from the West. Traditional Chinese education demanded the deep immersion in and con continuing conversation with the classics of Chinese philosophy, literature, and religion. As Kirby puts it, China is the world's longest continuing civilization with the longest continuing sets of philosophical and literary traditions. The study of that tradition defined not only what it meant to be a scholar, but also what it meant to be powerful. But after the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, Chinese education was reformed as part of a state mobilization for international competitiveness. Mathematics, science, and engineering became the focus, the sole focus of the curriculum. Arts and culture were to be firmly subordinated to the purposes of the develop, developmental state under both the, national, the nationalists and the communists. By 1949, Kirby notes, less than 10% of the graduates of Chinese universities graduated with degrees in humanistic disciplines. The communists then took that number to the vanishing point. And what was the result of that transformation? China denigrated nearly every aspect of a civilization that just a century earlier was the most sophisticated and accomplished on Earth. As the 21st century began, China confronted an emptiness at the heart of education 
and a disjuncture between a technocracy, technocracy and the civic purposes education is to serve. As China now discovers how to build institutions of higher learning there are, that are at the forefront of science and technology, and yet also honor and promote the humanities, there is a new desire to reconnect with cultural foundations. This is why, Kirby tells us, that statues of Confucius are now replacing statues of Mao. Even though, he adds, their works may still be equally unread. <laughs> now, I'd like to move toward a somewhat less qualified conclusion with a, with a final centennial reference. In 1912, the British statesman, statesman Viscount Richard Haldane, one of the founders of the London School of Economics and Political Science, published a series of essays entitled Universities and National Life, in which he argues that to maintain the university at a high level is an act of high patriotism on the part of the citizens, for it is in the universities that we see how the soul of a people at its highest mirrors itself. With the university's increasingly global footprint, the correspondence between national ethos and the scholarly community instantiated in it becomes more complicated, but also more dynamic. It becomes all the more necessary that the critical and interpretive power of, the, of humanistic inquiry be recognized as lying at the heart of the global university. As the Czech statesman Václav Havel put it several years ago in The Art of the Impossible, the world cannot just be explained. It must be grasped and understood as well. It is not enough to impose one's own words upon it. One must listen to the polyphony of often contradictory messages the world sends out and try to penetrate their meaning. Without the humanities, we cannot even hear the world as it speaks to us, much less respond and engage. Humanistic education can temper self-love with self-doubt and will balance self-fulfillment with an awareness of our connectedness to others. Humanism must always look backward even as it looks forward. It will be both innovative and conservative, valuing the local and embracing the global. We should ask for nothing less. When once asked the question, why is the study of the humanities worthwhile, an Australian friend of mine answered by comparing that enterprise with astronomy. Our society invests relatively heavily in the technology and expertise needed to see ever deeper into the skies. Why do we do so? There are many practical motives, to be sure, but the most basic reason is the simplest. We need, we want, to understand our place in the universe. And so it is with research and education in the humanities and social sciences. Our stu students deserve the opportunity to reach that understanding, and our faculty colleagues deserve the research opportunities to improve the knowledge on which it is based. I think that's a bright spot on the horizon and a grand project for our advocacy. Studies in the humanities pursue relentless inquiry into the question of value itself. Human beings seek and create meaning and value in language, literature, art, music, science, and in their very history. Students in the humanities, whether undergraduates in the classroom or faculty engaged in research, work constantly to understand, interpret, and question those values. Adhering to that fierce discipline may seem an ivory tower, cloistered exercise, but one need only read the financial pages to be reminded of the cost of not scrutinizing surface value. Some may be discomfited that the humanities often unsettle conventional worldviews, but that is how we make progress as a nation, as nations, and in the world. A world, a public culture, or a university education without the strong and central voice of the humanities would be impoverished and diminished. The reverse is equally true. The academic humanities without strong public rapport and colleagueship within the university will deserve the marginalization those absences will assure. So we must assert the case, we can assert that case, and we can do so without apology. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments if anybody has them. Yeah. Uh, 
That's a very good question. I wish I could, I wish I had the answer to that and perhaps somebody else here does. ACLS actually has a program um, which supports research in Africa. It's funded by the Carnegie Corporation and um, we're now in our second, I guess, four-year cycle. And it's, we're um, supporting uh, graduate students writing the dissertations and um, young faculty who are, um, who have research projects. I guess what I would say about African higher education was it was interesting to go there with a model of how you would conduct uh, a fellowship competition that was very different from how th they might conduct a fellowship competition. Basically, we had to persuade them that this was an open competition. Individuals wrote their own applications. They did not have to be recommended by their advisors, by their uh, superiors, by their presidents, by their deans, whatever. This was a novel proposition. And it took, um, it's a very, in other words, it's a very top-down structure. Um, and one way in which we tried to get buy-in into the whole process was actually to invite the deans and provosts and whatever to be part of our um, advisory committee and, and some of our selection, selection process. And so they sort of could see how you might do things otherwise. And I don't know if that's going to um, tweak um, sort of the, the way in which um, some things transpire there, but um, I mean, certainly it's, it's not gone, gone unnoticed. I will also say that most of the projects um, tended initially to be much more policy oriented than, um, than, than perhaps one would see in an American competition. And, um, and that, I mean, clearly there are very demanding issues of policy that need to, to be addressed. And I think the pressure had been on um, scholars to try to solve um, those current problems. And um, I guess we, what we've done is, is given them a little bit of freedom to kind of step back and perhaps see those problems in a larger context and whatever. That's all I know about about this, the situation of higher education in Africa. We've only worked with um, uh, universities and, and faculty in five countries. Um, the Carnegie Corporation, because of the, um, I guess, the conditions that were set up by its founder, can only work in, can only give money to um, countries of the former British Empire. So we, that was not our plan, but, um, you know, sometimes we have to, we have to bend to, um, to uh, other circumstances too. But it's, it's an interesting experiment. I wish we knew, I wish I knew more. I think there are people who do know more than I do and, and, um, and I should find out. Yes. Um, I'm a mathematician mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering, there are several uh, new things that I've been learning about collaboration between the humanities and mathematics. Mathematics, of course, is often a sort of tool, it's a sort of service area almost. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely support that. I mean, I, we, we actually um, um, at ACLS have a, have a fellowship program that is a, specifically for collaborative research. I mean, I think there are, I, I myself, you know, it would find it hard to imagine a specific example of that. I, would, I think we need to, to, to make space for that. No, I think that, that, that by no means is apologizing for the humanities. I think it's, um, it's very much, um, reaching out and sort of asserting the um, the connections that can be made between the humanities and other fields, and, and I think that's that's all to the good. Well, you mentioned Charlotte Kuzman from the National Academy of Science. Yes. Is on your board. So to do that, you are in Washington. You're in a part of the challenges with regard to power and split, the, the, the dividing line we see in Congress, <coughs> fighting. Questioning higher education, how is ACLS connected to the debate there in Washington as we in higher education work to help Congress appreciate and support higher education in general? And what approach do you use as we look at what NAS, the Academy of Sciences, and other places are using to talk about 
STEM mm -hmm. to make the points that you mentioned right now about whether it's about creativity or about who we are as human beings? That's a good question. I should say we actually are no longer in Washington. We, we, were, we started out in Washington because we were this you know, national representative to the International Union of Academies. But at some point, it's actually quite a while ago, the, the money ran out from the federal government, surprise, surprise, and they, you know, that they, they had provided much of the early support for ACLS. And ACLS, this is back in the late 50s, was on the verge of bankruptcy. So the then president, Frederick Burkhardt, um, was a wonderful, wonderful scholar, said, well, I'm going to go where the money is. He moved to New York uh, because the foundations were there. Because that was, the government already had proven to be um, maybe not as interested in supporting the humanities as, as they were becoming uh, interested in supporting the sciences. Well, ACL, we are part of a, as Esther McIntosh knows, we're part of a, a national humanities alliance which um, works every day in Washington to do exactly what you say. We um, maintain contacts with staffers in Congress. Um, we work to support the budget of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We have a, a Humanities Advocacy Day once a year, which is usually in March. We'd love to have people from UMBC be part of this army of, of um, humanity supporters going to visit their legislators and providing examples, making the same arguments that I'm making, but providing examples of, of uh, projects that have been supported by federal dollars, um, reminding people of the importance of the humanities to maintaining a civically minded civil society. Um, this is an effort that can never have um, enough people involved in it, and I think you know we, we see ourselves as part of this alliance that includes um, many professional organizations and um, many uh, colleges and universities uh, who work together. It's, it is, uh, someone once said of, in, in the Confucian Analects, uh, it, it said, is, is Confucius the guy who knows something's impossible but he keeps doing it? And so I think sometimes I feel that advocating the humanities is, appear, may appear to be very difficult, but that doesn't mean we don't keep doing it. Just a comment from yeah. some of our colleagues here in the Senate. One of our challenges will be to help not only the legislature, but potential donors yes. hear some of the arguments that you use. I love the language that said investing in the humanities is to really invest in the public. And I think, I think we can all begin thinking about where we're using that language as, we, as I bring people to this building mm -hmm. and talk about you know, that, that the, the fresh humanity scholar, it, it just so happens that the, the family said they understood the need support the humanity mm -hmm. and from Harper County. It's wonderful that they would, but to find more people who will understand that and to hear our examples and stories and language that can get them thinking about it. My ultimate goal is I want everybody to hear, but I'd rather see the idea of somebody giving us enough to talk about even endowing the building, mm -hmm. and the name of the building. It takes time, but it takes visits and discussions, seeing students and faculty, seeing the research they do, the difference it makes. And I think your being here really does give us a chance to begin thinking about who we are as a community, what the humanities will mean now and in the future for this institution and for the state and beyond. Thank you. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more about the importance of, of the humanities to um, to a university like like this one. I think, and I should say, I, I I don't. I hope no one took me as arguing against supporting the sciences. You know, I it's. It's, this is a, a question of what is, what is indeed a comprehensive liberal arts education and com, you know, a, a fully integrated society. I, it, it is true that the, what we're advocating for uh, when we go to the Hill is for a budget that is you know, less than 1% of the amount of money the government gives to the sciences. So it's not that much. But it makes a, a huge difference, and um, I, you know, I think that's we just have to keep arguing for it. I think you know one of the um, challenges that we all face is that people. It turns out they really love the humanities. They just didn't know that they. That's what they were. You know that. You know, you know that they. It's sort of like the, the um, 
bourgeois gentleman in the Moliere play, you know, he says, what, I've been speaking prose all my life, you know, <laughs> so, you know, it turns out I love, you know, I, I love going to museums, I love reading literature, I love, you know, reading about literature, I, and of course, there's nothing in that experience of art or literature that, that hasn't been enabled by the scholarship on the art and literature that, that you're reading about, and I, I think, Eventually, it dawns on some people, and um, that's you know that's when we get the donors. Yes. One of the points that I got from your lecture was the idea of embracing the ambiguity of the human condition. Uh huh. And I just sort of been playing in the back of my mind on what that means, and, and I was wondering, does that logically lead to an evolving ethics for humanity, or does it mean that? There is no common ethics in, in our human experience. The, you know, that idea of like ambiguity of the human condition. Right. If a, the human condition is ambiguous, does that mean there are no clear ethical guides to the human race? Um, I, I didn't mean to say, excuse me, that was, what did I lose? Oh, my, my paper. Um, I didn't mean to um, suggest I, that I mean the human condition itself is ambiguous, although it may well be. I, 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 I think my point was that there are so many questions that we address that, that may seem, um, that may be less clear than, than others. And well, certainly, I think everything is, you know, I was just listening to a piece about how the freedom of speech, you know, even that thing is ambiguous on what it actually means yeah. from culture to culture, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I understand what you mean by the ambiguity, and I think it challenges us to look at each phrase, like the, you know, freedom of speech in a more critical way in terms of what I have, is what I assumed, is that the only way of looking at it? But yeah. what I was trying to connect to was, how does that connect to any global ethics? Well, I think it means that you have to, I mean, it means, obviously it means that the whole discussion is much more complicated than some people would want it to be. But that, but that just means you have to keep struggling to actually try to gain greater clarity. And I'm, you know, I think there are some issues that it may well not be possible to gain as much clarity as, as some people as as some people would want to to acquire. But it's sort of you know the the, the same mandate exists to to, to at least argue about it rather than take a cert take certain positions for granted. I mean, I think that's a good point. It's um, uh, the idea that um, I think, I mean, this is sort of what teaching is all about too, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, that there are almost, there aren't that many questions in the humanities that are as clear as they might be in some other fields. and. Um, that's what makes teaching so challenging. I think uh, it's Andy Delbanco in his book again says that that's what the classroom is kind of this rehearsal space for democracy in that respect because you, you know, you, you would hope that students will speak with civility, will listen to each other with respect, will come to know the difference between an argument that is supported by evidence and something that's an opinion I quoted him when I was speaking earlier. And you might hope to walk out of the room at some points, um, having to have them walk out of the room, having changed their mind as a result of the, of the conversation. I think that, you know, it's the process that is, is so important and, and um, about any of these questions as well as about the whole enterprise of education in general. Yeah. As I, thank you, Hoffman. Um, as I was listening to your lecture, I tried to get a sense of who it was in the view who was demanding the policy coming to management. And the point that you seem to be very eager to address is the, the criticism that humanities would bring to the taken. And I think you, you can knock that argument out of the park. Right? But at other points in the lecture, you seem to be very insistent that the scholarship of humanities is you know, it's rigorous and possesses the fluidity of argument. Um, just as you know, in the field. And mm -hmm. My question is like, well, what what are the claims right, of the people who are banning the policy from the humanities for that reason? Right? I mean, what? <clears throat> well, I I, I, mean, I guess. Is there, is that, it seems to be something that you 
spoke a little on rather than uh, uh, except for and to assert that uh, the scholarship community is just as, just as rigorous and just as demanding. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess I should probably, you know, I, I may perhaps did not clarify sort of why why I want to make these points in the first place. And so the, the apology, I mean, I, you know, there's a history of the um, self-deprecation or and uh, self-marginalization, -mar which I think continues um, uh, continues into the present. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, um, in, in the sort of um, negative comparisons of, of, of that humanists will often make of, of themselves to uh, people in other fields or, or just the, you know, the constant um, uh, mantra that the humanities are in crisis and, I mean, the humanities have always been in crisis. I mean, higher education has always been in crisis. I mean, it's, it's, it, that is, it's, that's nothing new and um, I, I, I don't want to, um, you know, to bash the humanities in the way that many humanists um, often do. The, um, the, now, I've already forgotten the second half of your question, which was, what am I? Well, so, so what, what is the substance of the claim? Oh, yeah, uh, the, the, you know, mean the, the, the why? Is, and is that something that humanists want to take head on? Um, you know, so like, issues like the so-called books come to mind. If you're, if you're serious about scholarship, right, how do you, how do you negotiate that tension, right, when you know that, you know? Um, well, I, I guess my, um, what I'm concerned with is, 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 the argument on the part of humanists themselves that, in fact, um, they don't do scholarship. I mean, that they don't do research. Um, and in fact, I mean, you know, that um, because, and whether this gets back to sort of David Brooks' argument that, you know, what they do is something much more squishy or whatever. I mean, I, I yeah, we deal with a lot of squishy things, but, you know, we do them in ways that um, I think you know, uh, are in fact um, much less squishy than, than he would um, uh, suggest that they are. And uh, that, that's all I was saying. I mean, I just, I, I think that humanists themselves do not assert the um, sort of the research side of, of what they do. I mean, often what, you, what you'll find uh, is that they'll say, well, yeah, well we're, we're really good at teaching. You know, the, and so they, the justification, and this is true, humanists are really good at teaching, but it's not all that they do. And of course, good teaching, I would argue, is, is inextricably connected with, with, um, with strong research. So, I'm, you know, it's, I don't want to push the point too far. I mean, I'm not, I, I just, it's, I'm just trying to argue against what I think are sometimes invidious, um, um, statements about the humanities that, um, you know, are not helpful in the larger case. Yeah, there's a hand back there. I can't really yeah, see um, it. This is the past, uh, <clears throat> the past couple of commenters. Um, actually, I agree with you that sometimes the questions and the subjects that are broached by the humanities can seem more intangible. Um, but I think it's also a mistake to, to word them as um, less clear cut. Um, I think it's one of the things that causes a lot of us in the humanities to inadvertently apologize for ourselves, uh, to present us as less normative, to present us as less um, codified than the hard sciences, quote unquote. Um, I know my experience here in philosophy is actually um, greatly, and the research I've done here is actually, just as a student, um, has greatly really you know, helped people, I mean, people I've worked with see ethics beyond global, beyond, you know, beyond national, beyond um, disciplinary lines. I think one of the things like the philosophy it helps you see where certain disciplines and where their um, revelations and where their conclusions fit in in the greater scheme of things. Um, it helps you see where things fit in. And the work you do, I mean, just because you know, the work you do in uh, different humanities, it doesn't have to be any less, quote unquote, uh, normative or, or clear cut or precise than, um, say, physics or mathematics, um, even if you're dealing with something. Uh, as broad as ethics, you know, some of the questions you can ask and focusing, especially with research, can be clear cut. Um, depending on how you word them and what facet you're looking at. So I really think that's one thing I'd like to see, you know, uh, with more presentations and with more the way the humanities are taught and represented. Um, we don't 
have to worry about being you know, less broad, but you know, just more focused. Um, I don't see any reason need to sort of count over any idea that we're less normative or effective in that sense. I didn't hear everything you said, but I think <laughs> I, I think I. Correct, Nicole. Sorry. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to continue on the sort of the line of, of what kinds of research we do and what you might say is one of the causes of the marginalization and the, and the lower the devaluation, let's say, of humanity. And I don't agree that many of us say we're not doing research and we don't think the research we do is very, is very important. Certainly on this campus, I think a strong emphasis on what we do with is research departments. Uh, why it's the value is very simple to me. We contribute less to the bottom line than the STEM programs do, and then many of the social sciences do. And it's, it's kind of direct as to how much profitability you can get from the study and the research in humanity. Secondly, if I can point to uh, the sort of the research we do in, in our department, which is modern languages, linguistics, and intercultural communication, where we bring research in foreign languages together with our issues of intercultural communication. And here we have to look at problems within the humanities in terms of posing relationships, interrogating power. And that's an important thing that we do in the humanities. And if I can put a, a specific example, Intercultural communication simply deals with any case of human uh, cultural contact. That's the simple basis of the, the, the definition. That can go from the most violent, like the invasion of Afghanistan, a very clear example of intercultural communication. And there are, in fact, humans, anthropologists, who participate in the human as human terrain specialists to basically go in and get communities, find out what the communities are like so they can be better dominated or killed, but in a more culturally sensitive way. On the other extreme is those of us who are trying to find the basis for some sort of constructive, transformative, progressive intercultural communication, intercultural interaction that is, involves not just human cultures, but it involves the connectivities between ecological systems and human culture. And a lot of what we learn about that comes from places, particularly in Latin America, where it's highly developed. And so we go there to try to learn and to translate some of the ideas that come from there in terms of the interrogation of power. Because as long as the power relations stay the way they are, humanity's role can be developed. We have to aim for a cultural, political, and economic equality. It's utopian. That has to be as part of the goal of what we do. And that, in case, in any case, in our area, is a very concrete aspect of the kind of research that we do. Well, I think, you know, your point that this is research is, is extremely well taken. My, the reason I, I mean, I guess I sort of got on this, um, what inspired this is there was a, a panel um, at the American Philosophical so a Society uh, a few years ago on um, Amer the American Research University. And everybody on the panel talked about, it was on Jonathan Cole at, at Columbia wrote a book on that, and everybody on the panel talked about um, research only in terms of science. And so I just said, you know, I raised my hand and said, what, what about the humanities? And Hannah Gray, who was the a retired president of the University of Chicago and a, and a historian herself said, well, humanists are good at teaching, and period. And I, you know, so I'm, that's, I mean, I, I wasn't getting into specific, specifics of, you know, what sorts of research count as research is simply wanting to say, you know, the ways and the, the things we do and the questions we ask our research questions, and, and I mean, I think you've given examples of of different ways in which that can that can take place. Well, I think that after you had inspired us to ask lots of questions, <laughs> of what the humanities do, right? Um, we're not just about finding definitive answers. We're about asking questions. We're about challenging. We're about finding out who we are in the universe and realizing. 
realizing that's not static. And I thank you.